Good afternoon and welcome to today's Side by Side with the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities and Substance Use Services, Improving Our System Together monthly webinar. Before we get started, here are a few reminders about the webinar technology. Please make sure you are using a computer or smartphone connected to the internet. The audio function is on and the volume is turned up. Please be sure your microphone is muted for the duration of the call, unless you are speaking or asking questions. Questions can be submitted at any time during the presentation using the Q&A feature located on your control panel. We will answer as many questions as time allows toward the end of the presentation. American Sign Language interpreters and closed captioning options are available for today's event. The American Sign Language interpreters for today are Danette Steelman Bridges and Susan King Lanier. For closed captioning options, select the closed caption feature located on your dashboard. To adjust your video layout and screen view, select the view feature located in the top right hand corner of your screen and choose the one that works best for you. Today's agenda topics include introductions, the webinar schedule, MHSUD-IDD-TBI system updates. Our focus today is the peer support professional workforce. We will discuss actions to strengthen the workforce and have a conversation with our guest peer support specialists. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Kelly Crosby, Director for the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities and Substance Use Services. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today and welcome. I'm Kelly Crosby, and I am the Director of the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities, and Substance Use Services. <clears throat> and I have a frog in my throat, it would seem. So um, just to introduce myself again, this is what I always tell folks. I've had the pleasure of meeting many of you and working with many of you over the past year, but I've been in the field for many years. I've been with the department for many years as well, and I just celebrated my one-year anniversary with uh, in this role at the Division of Mental Health, Developmental Disabilities and Substance Use Services. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I'm a person with lived experience. I am super, super excited about today's topic, which is peer support. Um, and super excited about the conversation we'll have with Benji and Courtney later on in the conversation. We've got some certified peer support specialists here today. I was able to share with them how important peers have been in my own family's life. Um, I think peers are uh, amazing and wonderful, and um, I'm excited to talk with you today about um, the projects we have happening in the peer community. Um, on the next slide, um, I have a big announcement. Oh, I guess I'm not doing my big announcement yet, but I want to remind folks about how we engage every month. So every month we've got our side-by-side -side webinar. Every month our slides are a little wacky. Could someone go back to the um, go back to the? There we go. So every month we have our peer our, our side by side webinar. Every month at DMHGD SUS we host a meeting with our uh, families and consumers. They actually invite us to their meeting, which we appreciate very much. We meet with the LME MCO clinical leadership because we are trying to be on the same page statewide with all the clinical things we want to focus on in our priorities for the state because we are one state. We meet with providers and provider associations every month, and then we meet with a large work group from our hospitals, um, especially their behavioral health staff. Um, we've been talking month over month about all the investments we got from the General Assembly in this last session, and we have dedicated advisory groups talking about the dollars that we did get. Um, we're about to launch um, a Child Behavioral Health Advisory Committee to talk about the $80 million dollars. Um, that we got in the budget to work on children's behavioral health initiatives. And one of the groups we have that I'll lift up right now is our peer support specialist advisory group. <coughs> Benji, one of our uh, uh, peer specialists today, um, he is a, a, a very active member on the board group, as are many others on this call. On the next slide, I'll just remind folks that we have our next side-by-side -side webinar in March, and at that point, we will focus on our child behavioral health uh, spending. We will unpack the money that we got from the General Assembly, give folks a big overview of, of 
kind of from a, a topical perspective, the things that we want to focus on in the children's behavioral health space. And we'll be sure to tell you how you can get involved in that advisory group. On this slide and the last slide, uh, those slides will go out. There are our typical hot links that we wanna make sure that you see. So you can sign up for all the side-by-side -side webinars and you can also sign up for any of our advisory groups. They're open to the public. Um, Typically, and I think Badia already did it, uh, we'll drop in the chat too um, how you can register for those. They're open to all, uh, all are welcome, um, and you can be in all of them if you want to be in all of them. Um, we also appreciate at the end of today, you'll get a chance to do a, a survey on the side-by-side -side webinars. Um, we look at that feedback every month um, because we always want to make sure that these are meaningful and helpful to you all. We apologized last month, we had a snafu. Uh, the website was kicking folks off once we hit 350 people. That should be fixed. I'm actually watching the ticker today. We're getting close to 350. I wanna make sure that anybody who wants to be here can be here. Um, so hopefully that is fine, but appreciate um, your feedback on content. You wish that we would cover on anything else. Um, so um, thanks for filling out that survey at the end. All right. So I have a couple updates before we talk about today's main topic, which is peer support specialists. So if we go to the next slide to talk about some updates, the first slide is actually um, our, um, on our LMEMCO system. I thought we had a different slide. Um, so um, this is the map of our new LMEMCO system. As of February 1st, you all know that we've consolidated it into four different LMEMCOs. So this is the new map. You're used to seeing maps of our region all the time, but here is a new one. As a reminder, there were some fact sheets published about the consolidation. There were fact sheets for providers and members. All the bugs are still being worked out, y'all. Um, so please know, we know that everything is not perfect, but the goal was to make sure that whether you got state funded services or Medicaid funded services, or you were a grant funded project, that those were maintained during the transition. Some of that stuff's really weedy and it's really hard, but every single one of those programs and every single service that y'all are getting or your loved ones are getting are important. So uh, we want to know how the transition is going. We want to make sure that the new configurations of uh, consumer and family advisory councils is working. And we are always interested to hear feedback and please reach out to us if you're having any issues. Folks have reached out over the past couple of weeks. We are here, Medicaid is here to help support folks during the transition. Next slide, please. Tailored plans. So please note that this is just the first of more information coming out on tailored plans, but we wanted to make sure that we got a couple of key messages across today. Tailored plans are going to launch July 1st, 2024. I understand that we've had different announcements over the past couple of years, launching tailored plans, pausing tailored plans. Tailored plans will launch as of July 1st, 2024. In late April, People on Medicaid who are gonna go into a tailored plan are going to get a letter about their tailored plan. It will tell you the tailored plan that you're in and additional information. So remember today is a very high level information, um, but as we go along, we're gonna be giving out more information like about those letters and what's going to be in them. As a reminder, the behavioral health tailored plans are the LMEs. So I hope, I think after many years fix, I've made that connection, but you might not have. Every day I talk to folks and they don't know the difference. What is an LME? Like, what is that? It's very North Carolina name. What's a tailored plan? It's a very North Carolina name. But if you know your LME, you know your tailored plan. So um, that's why it's important to remember that new map because you might have a new LME in your county, but your LME is your tailored plan. And our four tailored plans are our four LMEs, Alliance, Partners, Trillium, and Via. okay? So in April, you're going to get a letter saying, hey, here's your new plan. It's going to have other information in it as well. And then in May, the plan, so Alliance Partners, Trillium or Maravilla, your LME, is going to send you a welcome packet. It will tell you much more about your Medicaid plan because it's a Medicaid plan. And you'll get a new ID that says you're in VIA's network or Partners Network. It'll tell you that you're in the plan. That packet's also going to tell you who your primary care doctor is. So you will have time before that date to pick one, but even after you get the, your new card and your new letter, you can change your primary care doc if you don't like the one that you got. And uh, so that letter is going to explain that to you, who's your primary care doctor and how to change if you want to. 
Next slide. A few reminders. Things are a lot of things are staying the same. Okay, just want to remind folks. Remember, this is the first of many key messages that we'll have over time. Tailor plans are LMEs. They are. LMEs will operate as tailor plans. So it's the folks that you've known for years and years and years and years. Folks are still going to have access to the same mental health, substance use, IDD, TBI services that you did before, whether it was a Medicaid service, a state service, grant funded programs. Okay. Remember, TBI waiver is still just an alliance, right? But you're not going to lose that. You'll have that in tailor plans as well. So remember, innovations waiver members and TBI waiver members, you'll keep your slots, no issue. If you're on the innovations wait list, you will also keep your spot on the innovations wait list. So that's always a concern with consolidation or when tailor plans go live, you'll certainly keep your slot in your services. And if you're on the wait list, you'll keep your spot on the wait list, regardless of consolidation. But what's changing? So it's all the things that you already know. You're with your LME, you're getting your mental health, substance use, IDD, TBI services. It might be a state funded service. It might be a Medicaid service. You might have a slot. You might be on a wait list. That's all going to be the same. But now the LME is also going to pay for your healthcare services too. So your primary care doctor, hospital services if you need them, uh, if you go to a cardiologist, your, your kids if you go to a pediatrician, and your medications too. So your LME will be responsible for paying for or, or making sure that your medications are covered when you go to the pharmacy. You're going to have a primary care doctor. You already have one in Medicaid. And the goal, Medicaid had the goal of making sure all your primary care doctors signed up with the LMEs. And you also have a tailored care manager. Most people have a tailored care manager now, or you were assigned to one. Some people use it, some people don't. But you'll have access to a tailored care manager as well. So everyone gets a primary care doc and everyone gets a tailored care manager. So Lots of things are staying the same. It's more like, and now the LME is also going to cover your medical services and your pharmacy costs as well. All right, next slide. So before we talk about peer support specialists today, I had a slide. It came up a couple of times and we never talked about it. It was today's big announcement. So can we go back to the slide on the peer warm line? So we need to go backwards a little bit, y'all. Okay, this was today's really, really, really big topic. As we start to segue into talking about peer services and the incredible value of peers, and we talked to some peer experts today, I want to let you know about a resource that is coming soon. I wish I could give you the number today and told you it went live today, but it it's very soon, y'all, like really soon. So really soon you will see an announcement about our statewide peer warm line. We have a partner. We have a peer-led organization who is our partner. We will announce that as well. Um, why are we doing a peer warm line? For so many reasons. People are calling 988 right now and they're looking for support and resources. So 15% of people are calling in crisis, but lots of people are calling to have someone to talk to and lots of people are calling for resources. 40% of our callers right now are repeat callers because they won't need someone to connect with and someone to talk to. Peer Warm Line is for those folks, and it's for lots of other folks who don't want to call 988 because they're thinking, I'm not in crisis. So the Peer Warm Line will be open just like 988, 24-7, 365 days a year. People will be able to call this Peer Warm Line directly. So we have a number that you will be able to recognize. It won't be as simple as 988, but you will be able to recognize it, a nice, simple number. You can call it directly, or if you call 988, they'll be able to transfer you over to the peer warm line if that's what you want. You don't have to, but if that is what you want, they'll be able to offer that as a resource and do a nice warm handoff right over to the peer warm line. Why peer warm line? You know, there's peer warm lines already in the state, in pockets of the state. They're incredibly valuable. We think poor peer specialists are incredibly valuable. So we want the opportunity for people to connect with another person with lived experience, who have walked in their shoes, similar circumstances, have navigated for themselves, with their family members, with their kids, with whoever the experience of perhaps dealing with a mental health issue, substance use, perhaps helping their child who has autism or uh, their child who has a traumatic brain injury, that connection, a person who understands what it's like to be in that situation 
and also to navigate the system. We want to make sure that folks have people to connect with and talk to that understand, that have empathy, but also can help understand the system better, the resources, um, better paths to call um, in the system. And we know peers are wonderful because they have that lived empathic experience, but also know how to navigate the system. So the peer warm line, there's lots of other peer services and, and things we're going to talk about today, but um, the peer warm line should be announced incredibly soon. We're very excited about the peer warm line as a needed statewide resource here in North Carolina. Okay, so that is the segue into today's topic, which is peer support services here in North Carolina. So we're gonna go back to that section of the deck. All right, okay. So a couple, I'm gonna do a couple introduce, introductory uh, slides before I introduce you to today's special guests, Benji and Courtney, and I'll introduce them in a moment. But I like to set the stage, okay? As a reminder, even before I get to this slide, uh, part of the funding that the General Assembly gave us was for behavioral health workforce supports. And we have decided first to focus some of those supports on uh, direct support professionals like we talked about last month, but also peer support specialists. So just to set the stage, we got some dollars. Regardless of the dollars, we were going to invest and improve our peer support specialist infrastructure in North Carolina, but we got some dollars, so that makes it even better and easier. Right now, many of you on the, the phone know this because you, um, you, uh, you're here because you know peer support specialists or you are one or, or perhaps you employ peer support specialists or you work with one. Um, but maybe there's folks on the, the call that don't know about peer support specialists. We have a peer support specialist certification program or programs here in North Carolina. BMH, CVS US, so our organization, we have a partnership with UNC Springboard. Probably lots of folks know UNC Springboard. And they implement our North Carolina Certified Peer Support Specialist Program. What does that mean that they implement it? So what they do is they use the national best practice standards. They review and approve the certification courses. For those of you in the know, we have multiple organizations that do certification here in North Carolina. But before they can, Springboard reviews their criteria against national standards to ensure it meets national standard guidelines. They also uh, in, uh, have uh, uh, convened for us a um, North Carolina Certified Peer Support Specialist Work Group. So they have an advisory group for the certification program, also for the experience, the work, ex the, the experience of working as a peer in North Carolina. They also evaluate the program. So some of the statistics I'm going to tell you today come from Springboard. So they evaluate things like folk, number of folks who are getting certified, their satisfaction with the certification programs. Um, what happens? Are they getting employed as a peer support specialist? Uh, if so, why or why not? So they're evaluating the effectiveness of our certification program here in North Carolina. There is a website. So there's a link to the website there in, um, in the slide deck if you're interested. Um, and you can find lots of information there. Uh, and it's very much about here's the national standards, here's the places you can go to get peer support specialist training in your area. It also will advertise when we have special uh, pilot programs like our older adult peer support specialists, like our uh, forensic or justice involved peer support specialist program. So you can find all that on the website. So it's good. It's just a lay of the land of where we are. We've already identified in our peer support advisory work group things that we want to improve about the way the system works. More on that in a few slides. Okay, so that's, we have certified peer support specialists here, uh, a certification program here in North Carolina. This is what it looks like. All right, next slide. We also fund a lot of peer initiatives in North Carolina. So one of the things you won't see on this slide, but just as a reminder, peer support specialist as a standalone service is covered currently under Medicaid. It's covered in, in the way that all services are, right? Like you, you have to bill in certain minute increments and you have to do certain documentation standards and there's a policy for it. 
and the, and it, and, it, and the, the good thing is is that it's a Medicaid covered service. Um, uh, certainly, we've got feedback about how does the a peer support model fit into that build concept, but still, it's covered, which is cool, which is a an endorsement. We got peer support services covered as a billable service years ago because we believe in peer support services. But in addition to that, our division funds over 20 peer initiatives across the state. And that's both good and bad. And let's talk about the good first, and then we'll talk about maybe not bad because it's all good, but a way to capitalize on that good a little bit more than we have. Okay, so it's all good. So here are just some examples of ways that we're funding peer initiatives in North Carolina. So um, in Asheville, for instance, we have a peer operated respite program. And I believe I saw some statistics. We have served, I think, uh, um, somewhere, I felt like it was 600 plus people have been served in that respite program um, over the past several of years. So it's really good especially if you live in Asheville. So that's an example of like, oh, how can we capitalize on something that is good and maybe do more of it? Problem gambling. I was having a conversation with some legislators this morning on problem gambling and the real concern about its rise and increase. So we have problem gambling programs here, but we have peer support helplines for problem gambling 24 seven, really cool resource. We currently fund two peer run recovery community centers. And some of those centers support and mentor other centers throughout the state. So like really cool. We also have some specific service provision pilots. So for example, at the moment, we have a peer pilot at Cape Fear Hospital. We've had these at other hospitals before. We have peers in emergency departments and they're helping people to successfully leave the emergency room and get connected to community services. And we're getting good success from these programs. In our Moore's pilot, um, when we talked about crisis a few months ago, I think we talked about mobile crisis Moore's, which is our crisis response system for adolescents. So as part of Moore's, we have family peers, which is really cool, right? So families who can connect to and help other families. But these are specific pilot programs in seven regions of the state. And then lastly, we get some juvenile justice grants. Some of you get them too. But with our juvenile, uh, with our BJA grants, not our juvenile justice, I'm sorry, with our BJA grants, with some of our grants, I mentioned some of our justice involved peer programs. And so we are using peers in some of our diversion. So diverting from jail, but also our re-entry programs, because we, again, peers we think are a truly powerful resource to help people navigate services and system, and they've been there and lived that, and they're particularly powerful in working with our justice-involved folks. So these are just some examples. And so um, the, here's the good, and then I'll say, and it could be better. The good is we have these things. The could be better is... How can we have more of these consistently across the state? Cool pilots isn't necessarily a systemic or statewide set of programs and services, which is what we want to get to. So two more slides, and then I'm going to introduce our awesome, awesome uh, speakers. Benji, oh, four more slides. We have a lot of peer support specialists across the state, okay? So we got a lot of peer, certified peer support specialists. It's over 4,000. It's over 4,500. So see them all, every county across the state. Now, here's some facts. Remember, I told you Springboard does evaluation program. Let's go to the next slide and look at facts. Only about 37% of certified peer support specialists are employed or volunteering in a peer support role. So less than half of the folks that are going through the certification process are employed as a peer. A significant portion, about 22%, are actively seeking employment right now. And about 25% of our certified peer support specialists are employed in a different field. Sometimes it's a related field. Sometimes it's just another field altogether. Now, some of that makes sense. Some people just get the certification because it does support what they're doing. Maybe they're a community health worker. Maybe they're a licensed clinician doing therapy, but they're also a peer. So they want to become a certified peer support specialist. But we are hearing a decent amount of feedback from folks about um, reasons why successes and maybe room for improvement 
on what it's been like to try to get employment and feel supported in an employment environment. We've heard from providers where successes and challenges in hiring peers. So, but these are not quite the statistics we wanna see, right? If folks are getting certified and they, they are certified because they want to work as a certified peer support specialist, we want to make sure they have the opportunity and those supports. So on the next slide, you will see our vision. This is what we're working on, okay? We want a system of peer supports that values the expertise of people with lived experience, period, heart stop. We want a system of peer supports that encourages opportunities for continued growth of the field. We want the field to grow. We want people to grow in that role. It's a wonderful role to hold up, to value, to grow. And we want to make sure that our system is accessible, inclusive, and representative for all communities across the state. So I've mentioned things like um, peers for older adults, family peers, but we also don't have access to peers and some of those peer services that I mentioned, we don't have access everywhere across the state. We don't always have access to um, peer support certification in Spanish for those who um, are Spanish speaking. We don't always have marginalized groups who are raising their hand and getting certified as peer support specialists. So there's a lot to work on in terms of making sure that the certification is inclusive and culturally humble. So it actually makes sense uh, for other folks and it's meaningful and that we are making sure that the training is inclusive um, to all communities and all groups, as well as the service array and supports that we offer. So here is our goals. So this is our vision, right? Here are the goals. Here are the very concrete goals we are working towards. We're trying to make the process to become a peer more affordable and attainable. So right now, it can be confusing to find certification. All certification is not created equal. It costs different amounts of money. But none of that's good. <laughs> we want it to be easy. We want it to be high quality. And we want it to be as low or no cost as possible, period. Make sure that the career is well-defined and there's a chance for growth and opportunity. So we want peers to be able to grow in the career. We want them to have well-defined roles and we want them to feel valued, respected and supported in the care team. Part of that is paying a living wage, but also funding providers who offer peer support services. So many build services, whether it's Medicaid or state funded services, allow for peer specialists on the team. I think they should encourage or mandate peer support specialists on the team, but we have to make sure that the role of the peer is well-defined so the peer is well-supported, but also the provider understands how to support, reimburse, and effectively use peers. So that's the next goal. We want to support employers in integrating peers on multidisciplinary teams, really critical. So it's 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 a both end. We want to make sure peers are supported, they, they find jobs that are, make sense to them, and that employers essentially know how to hire peers. How do peers fit on teams? How do we use them to their maximum abilities? How do we pay them for the value that they bring? So really kind of making certification easy, but then making that work matching and work support experience good for both peers and the agencies that employ them. Now, finally, for the community, we want to make sure that peer services and supports are available across the continuum, including in crisis services. So Peers should be in crisis settings. Peers should be in justice settings. Peers should be on ACT teams and CST. Family peers should be used for intensive in-home. So there's lots of places that peers should be plugged in. And we want to make sure that the peer field is equitable and inclusive. So we have Spanish speaking peers, justice involved peers. Do we have peers in African-American and black communities and in Latinx communities? We don't, we don't have full coverage nor do we have a full array of services. We have pockets of goodness. We have so many high quality and um, incredible peer support specialists, but they need supports, employers need supports, um, and we need to make sure it is inclusive and we've got a great array of peer services across the state. Okay, so these are our goals. And these are the things our advisory committee is looking for. We spent a lot of time interviewing lots of people across the state. And what we've actually been um, sharing with the advisory committee are the results and the recommendations um, that we've been getting from folks across the state. And it's everything about the certification process um, through um, what employment is like for peers. And um, um, so the, all of these recommendations are coming from those interviews and our conversations with the advisory committee. 
Okay, next slide. So let us meet some awesome peer support specialists. 30 more seconds, and then I'll introduce Benji and Courtney. I've shared with folks before, and I've, I've, I would never had the pleasure of having a certified peer specialist work with myself or my family. But I have had, um, I've, I've shared with folks before, like I've got family members and, and my dad in particular, serious mental illness. And the most effective help that my dad ever got, he didn't really get things like formal treatment or clinical care. The thing that always resonated with him and helped him tremendously was talking to a peer, a peer who had similar experiences, similar traumatic experiences, and was able to talk about the system and how they navigated it or not. And that was so helpful for him. He felt like he had a connection to someone who genuinely understood what his situation was like and could empathize with him, but also uh, could help them him figure out the system. Now, I, I make a point of saying that that was more uh, uh, naturally connecting with peers and people with the same lived experience. I don't pretend it is the great work that Courtney and Benji does, uh, uh, but um, it was something, that connection to someone who knew what it was like and that a little bit of help even here and there with figuring out the system uh, was incredibly valuable, more so than any little bits of treatment uh, that my dad uh, got over the years. And so I am very, very grateful for peers. So um, I uh, am ex very excited to talk to Benji and Courtney today. So uh, what I'm going to do is we've got uh, great photos and bios of both Benji and Courtney, um, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Here's all their, the wonderful things that they do. But Benji, Benji, who's the Director of Outreach at, at Veteran Services of the Carolinas. Benji, could I let you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Director Crosby, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Benjamin Horton. Um, like Director Crosby said, I'm the Director of Outreach at Veteran Services of the Carolinas. And I am a certified peer support specialist in the state of North Carolina, and I have the absolute honor to be able to lead a team of 15 peer supports across the state now. Um, but the one thing that I've done in my life that is the most important, all the degrees, everything else, is getting that certification because that meant recovery happened for me. And that was the most difficult part. But I had so many people supporting that. And that truly was uh, the most important part of what I've ever done. Awesome. Thank you, Benji. And I'm going to be asking Benji lots of questions. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce next Courtney Wright. I just got to meet Courtney last week. And Courtney Wright is a child and family support specialist at Healing Transitions. I'm delighted uh, that you're here with us today. Thank you, Courtney. And I will turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's nice to see you again. So my name is Courtney Wright. I am the Child and Family Peer Support Specialist at Healing Transitions. I have worked in this role for two years, but prior to this, I was also a peer on a post overdose response team, and that was kind of my introduction to um, peer support. Um, what I have realized that my purpose in life, no matter if I stay in this role or I continue to grow, my purpose in life is to help other individuals like me cut on that light and then pass it to their children. Um, so when their children are older, they don't have to do the same. So that is my purpose. That kind of tells you what I want to do in life, what makes me smile, and um, why I love being a peer. I once was that child in a household of mental health and substance use. I was able to change that narrative for my children, and now I watch mothers uh, and help mothers do the same thing. So. I love that, Courtney. Thank you so much. All right. I got a big list of questions for Benji and Courtney. Um, and hopefully if we have some time, we could take some audience questions too. We tried to leave a lot of time for this part of the conversation. So I'm going to start easy. And you, they've seen all the questions, y'all. Um, start easy. So Courtney, why don't you go first? I think because you already kind of said this. Why did you decide to become a peer support specialist? So substance use and mental health definitely runs in my family. and so. Um, when I first came to treatment, uh, the first detox I ever went to, it was more of a medical setting. It was actually at Tanglewood in Lumberton. 
and um, it's, it is run by nurses. So they give the meds, they help through the withdrawals, all those things. But there was this one nurse in there and um, she would talk to me. She was the first person who really made me feel comfortable. And she did not have substance use, but her partner did. And so she would tell me stories about, you know, her partner and him still in her car or, you know, and I could relate to what she was saying. And it was the first time I didn't feel like someone was judging me, looking down on me, like she completely knew how I felt, um, even though it wasn't her, but just her sharing that piece with me, it kind of made it uh, better and easier. And so when I came to Raleigh to um, this recovery program, it was a peer ran facility. And so <laughs> most of the people who worked here, um, had once went through the program. And so it was, you know, very apparent that this model works. I love it. Thank you, Courtney. How about you, Benji? Why did you decide to become a peer specialist? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, stories are so similar for so many peers, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we go through childhood and, and the trauma coming through childhood. My father was an alcoholic and had mental health uh, challenges. And I grew up with that and it, it was normal and you know I, I started doing the same thing and, and I started walking that same path. Um, I was medically retired from the Navy um, following the injury and I was I was paralyzed from the chest down and that that same thinking of, of alcohol turned to other uses and I was broken. I truly was broken both mentally, physically, and I had all the support in the world. I don't know why my wife's been with me 24 years, but she has, very thankful for that. But what really helped me, almost the same as you talked about, Director Crosby, is, is other veterans saying that that's okay, right? It's, it's okay to seek help. It's okay not to worry about the stigma that, that has been attached to this for so long. And, during that time, I was I was working as an electronic warfare technician, and I just wasn't fulfilled. I had a missing something, and I thought back to that time of going through recovery and those veterans helping me, and I wanted to give back and and offer that hand up for others, and just happened to stumble across what a peer support specialist was, and the light went off, and it was. Um, meant for me to do and it's been a tremendous blessing to have that opportunity thank you benji courtney i'm gonna go back to something that you said you mentioned how um you know you were in a program that's run by nurses but one of them had a partner with lived experience i'm curious from your point of view what does a peer do differently maybe than a clinician a social worker a, a nurse a psychiatrist what what's different about what a peer brings to the table um, I think as a peer, we're, we have the flexibility to share our experience. We have this flexibility to tell what life was like before, um, without the fear of being judged or the fear of the individual saying, well, you can't help me because you were once like me. Yeah. Um, and as a clinician, um, you know, there's stipulations around that. If, if you say too much, the individual may not want help from you anymore. So I think um, there's definitely a distinction. And now professionals, I have felt empathy from them, but the amount of empathy or compassion I receive from someone else who knows the feeling is very different. And I would hate to call it um, uh, uh I just don't, I don't have a word to describe it. It's like, they know me, you know, <laughs> they, yes. she knew me. She yes. knew what I was experiencing. She knew the pain I felt because she also was living it in her life just from her partner's point of view. Thank you. That reminded me of, um, you know, when I was a kid, I remember, you know, you remember bits and pieces of things from your kid. I remember one time, I didn't know what it was, but in hindsight, I know it was like a, cl a clinic that my dad went to. I think it was the vet vet's clinic, actually. And I remember being in the waiting room, just a kid. And I remember he came out of a room with a gentleman. And I remember this distinctly because my dad didn't say too much. He sat down with the guy and he said, I want you to meet this and such. I don't remember his name, but I remember what he said. He said, he understands me. 
I'll never forget that. I'll never forget why I remember what he said that probably because I didn't know where the strange place was and my dad was in a good mood and he actually said something, but he said he understands me. And that really is really powerful um, for me. I will, I will never forget that. Benji, how about you? What do you bring to the table that a clinician it, it may be different? And clinicians are great. I'm a clinician, y'all. Love clinicians. But Benji, what do you bring to the table that's different, you think? No, I, I think that's that's true, right? Is I, I fall right on both sides. Of it. But I have mm -hmm. I, I have really helped more people as a peer support specialist mm -hmm. as I ever will from the clinical side. And I'm sure many people on this call have heard the uh, story of a person fell in a hole. Right. And, you know, the psychiatrist came by and, and, and heard the person crying out from the emotional distress. Um, and he stopped and said, how did you get here? You know, did your did your parents drop you off here? And after about 30 minutes of talking, the, the psychiatrist walked away and said, I'll see you next week. Well, the peer support specialist came by and, and the person cried out and the person said, I'm stuck in this hole. Please help me. Well, the peer support specialist just jumped in the hole with him, right? Uh, yeah. And the peer support, you know, the guy looked at him and said, now we're both stuck in here. And the peer yeah. said, no, I've gotten out before and I will stay here with you and help you get out of this hole yourself. And that's the thing about a peer support, right, is we might not give you the solution to get out because everybody's an expert on their own body. Mm -hmm. Well, what we will do is stand beside you, walk alongside you, and empower you to see the strengths that you do have and, oh, like and really lift you up out of that hole together. I love that. I love that. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to switch gears and ask you to give some advice. All right. What would you, what advice might you give to a new certified peer specialist about how to do their job well, maybe even how to? maintain their own recovery while they're being a peer that's a big one Benji you want to go first since you're on yeah I sure will there because I think um you know we have so many new peers that that come on and I think the most important thing is really being able to draw boundaries right mm -hmm. knowing when it's okay to say no mm -hmm. um, you know knowing that that your recovery is just as important um, because if you're not 100% or close to it, how are you supposed to give back to others? And it's really hard as a new peer to draw that line um, because you're, you're ready to change the world and you're yes. so excited about getting in the trenches and you burn out, right? And, and I think that's really important for employers to understand too that, you know, we have to look out for our peers and, and give them an opportunity to, to really say, I need a mental health day before that turnover starts happening. Yeah. Um, just being able to understand that is truly important. Mm -hmm. Yes, most definitely. Thank you, Benji. Courtney, how about you? Um, kind of goes along with what Benji said. I, I always say you can't save anyone, right? I know we want to, we want to save everybody. But at the end of the day, we do not have the power to save anyone. We can only lead them. And then um, fill your cup because <laughs> we cannot give anything we don't have. I can't give you water if my cup's empty. And so I always, like like Bidja said, take that mental health day. Go home. Do something for yourself. When <laughs> you're home, you're home. That's it. You have to leave work at work because I think as a peer, that's one of the hardest things of it's bringing it home with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I, I, I think one of the, as you guys were saying, I think that was probably resonating with a lot of people. So whether you're a peer specialist on the call or you're just, it, maybe you're a clinician, maybe you're in the helping profession, maybe you're a family or a loved one, that idea of taking care of yourself. I love what you said, fill your cup. Um, and you can't save anyone. I think those are like really powerful things. But I think you both, you and Benji, also really highlighted it's 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 also not just you got to fill your cup because you're a caregiver, but you're also trying to maintain your wellness and your recovery as well. Um, and that's critical. It's critical for you as a human, for you and your life, 
but also for you as a professional, you've got to maintain your recovery, fill your cup up so you can be the best certified peer that you can be. Um, so here, this is a, this is a, well, that's a big, yeah, I'll do the big one. Courtney, what is the biggest challenge in your opinion for peer support specialists working with individuals in the community? Biggest challenge, that's why I don't, it could be anything. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand with what I just said. The yeah. biggest challenge is um, watching someone start to make process, progress and then go right back. And so to see see yeah. that light come on and then it cut right back off or to lead them to the water and they're right there on the edge and, you know, their life is getting better. And then yeah. all of a sudden it's back to where it was because we don't stop helping them, you know. Just yep. because they don't show up and they don't call and those things, we don't stop. We continue to help them. And so we see them in these moments of clarity and then these moments of struggle and these uh, moments of, you know, shame, guilt and remorse. And, yeah. and, you know, sometimes we start wearing those feelings on our own because we forget we can't save anyone, right? Yeah. Yes, so I think that is the biggest struggle or has been the biggest struggle for me is that um, watching them get a little better and then regressing. Mm -hmm. That's why the recovery journey is not straight, is it? It's up and down and down and downer and sometimes up and upper. Um, and that is really hard. I hear that a lot from family members, but you're a approaching them as a, as a, as a peer. So you're with them in and out, up and down through those situations. So Benji, how about you? Biggest, biggest challenge supporting individuals in the community. Yes. I think Courtney was really spot on with what she said. You know, I, I see it a lot and I, I have it quite often is that trauma bonding and being uh -huh. able to really step back from that. Yes. On the fear side, right? Because you're still you're still in recovery. You still remember those times, and yes. you go through so much with this individual as you're walking alongside them. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to draw that line. And and like you know, like we talked about, we can't save the world. Mm -hmm. Um, and be able to just pull back, draw those boundaries, and be able to really have the community provide that wraparound some support for that individual mm -hmm. yeah because it is a collaboration um, yeah it takes us all working to build that individual up yeah um, so yeah i, I agree 100 percent you know what courtney said do you have a follow-up on that i mean you mentioned this this again now boundaries having boundaries and I, you mentioned trauma, which I think is really, really interesting, right? So you you might have your own trauma that makes you a really good peer, perhaps, and you're helping a person deal with that trauma. That can be really hard yourself when you're dealing with your own trauma. As a peer, how do you or how would you advise people to help keep those boundaries? Two ways, honestly. Um, you have a team for a reason. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. you, use your team. Yeah. Talk to your team. Open, honest, transparent communication with that individual of what mm -hmm. you can and can't do. Yep. But also being able to talk to somebody else, another mm -hmm. peer, a therapist. Yeah. yeah. Really, yeah. as peers, I know I still need it. Right. Mm -hmm. I still yep. talk to my clinician all the time. Yes. Um, and I think that's important, but self-care mm -hmm. you know, and knowing when to draw that line and, and tell them that, hey, I, I just cannot, I don't feel comfortable doing this. But if this is something that you need, let me connect you with the right person that can do that. Right? Like that. It, as a peer, you're a GPS for success. Um, and it's really, and I stole that from the Thrive Institute. I, I like that. I was going to say, I'm going to steal that. Yeah. yeah. I love it. But no, I love it. You said that's critical. You, I, you go to your team, right? You're working in a team. They can help you think through things in a different way or check you or your own. Who, who's, who's your point in your recovery? Is it a clinician? Is it another peer? But what a balance. All right, Courtney, over to you. What was the certification process like for you? Hard left. What was that like? We're trying to make sure the certification process works. 
Well, I was blessed. Um, oh, good. I, now, with the recertification, that's a different story. But I was blessed with the <laughs> certification part of um, when I when I got my job, they funded it. They allowed me to clock in for work and go to the classes. So I was really blessed. Um, so I got it paid for and was paid for going to get it. Um, so that, but had I not had that, um, I wouldn't have been able to pay for it. I just couldn't have paid that money out of pocket. Um, and then also I wouldn't have had the time because I would still have to work. So that, that would have been, um, an issue, but thank God it wasn't. Uh, I now, there was laziness on my part for the recertification. I missed it by a day. I okay. missed it by a day. And so I don't know if you know this or not, but if you miss it by one day, you have to get all your training hours after huh. the day you've missed. And so um, I was in school at the time and I said, well, I'll just use my schooling once I'm finished with this semester. Well, by then it had lapsed. Oh, no. Um, I'm currently in a peer support title, yeah, yeah. just not fully certified as peer support, which is something I'm working on now. But yeah, the process was easy and again, blessed, but. It sounds like it was easy because you had the kind of support you need. You had the freedom to be able to take a, someone purchase the course for you, but it does sound like we're a bit rigid on the recertification process. So um, um, interesting. So that's good to know. Okay, good feedback. I'm going to take that back, Courtney. Benji, how about you? What was certification like for you? You know, I, I can't complain either. I was truly blessed. Um, the organization I work for, they uh, they paid for me to go through the training, um, paid me for that training. And, and there's so many peers that don't have that opportunity. Yeah. Right. And I know that's something we've talked a lot about in the advisory committees, um, yeah. just the discrepancy in that. And Yes. How expensive it can be for others. Yeah. Um, my recertification was was truly easy as well. Um, you know, I finished my master's degree, so a lot of the a lot of the uh, CEUs were covered by that. Um, and just being able to send in my DD two fourteen made the military designation super easy. Yeah. Um, so I think it, it it was a great process for me. Now I did I did the first one online. Uh -huh. during COVID, um, which was very challenging to really be able to open up um, during, you know, during the class in breakout right. sessions. So that yeah. Was yeah. Okay. Final question for both of you. All right. Benji, you'll go first. You're on camera. Um, so talked about just what it's like to be a poor peer support specialist, period. What certification was like. I want to talk about employment for a moment. Can you share like a really positive experience as an employee, as a peer, employed peer, maybe one that wasn't so positive? Yeah, absolutely. I think the uh, the amount of support that that we have had as peers in the organization is second to none. Um, yeah. You know, really being able to to take that knee if we need to, knowing that there's not going to be any repercussions that we're going to get phone calls from our director, from our chaplain, from other team members, just checking to make sure we're okay. And that that's tremendous. You're doing a job to really empower someone else to walk that road, um, that they cared enough about your own recovery to do that. Um, a lot of times frustration, you know, sets in when the, the training or the job's not there. And I've mm -hmm. seen that quite a few times, right? Mm -hmm. All right, this is your job description. Good luck to you. Um, and, and your mind's going 100 miles an hour. Well, where are the left and right limitations? Why do I yeah. need to do? Yes. And that's sometimes you can cross into a line that peers are not meant to be. Yes. Yeah. Have you had good, it has, has good, supervision by another peer being helpful in those situations benji 100 percent. yeah that's when you that's when you lean on somebody that's been here longer that, yeah that has has more experience and yeah it's okay to say i don't know 
Yeah, absolutely. No, it was interesting to hear you to to hear you talk through that and linking it to some of the things we've been talking about in the advisory committee because I think, you know, I think that's uh, it was similar to the experience as a clinician. I got lots of training, and then someone said, "Here's your job description. Here you go. Here's the ten people that you're going to meet with today and talk with." And I was like, "What now? What?" <laughs> Right. And there's a lot you want to do a good job, but you also have to know like what the boundaries are of your role. And that's, uh, I imagine, even trickier uh, when you're a peer specialist. Um, um, how about you, Courtney? Maybe a really positive experience you've had in, a, in, a, in a, being employed and maybe a, a not so positive experience. Um, kind of similar to Benji. Um I had a really good team, especially my first two years on the post overdose response team. We were all um, all peer support, um, great supervision, and we also have a mentorship program at my job. So these are individuals who are outside of our organization that we can lean on, so which is real, really oh, cool. important. Yeah. yeah. So she is still my mentor today. I love her to death, and she's also a peer. Um, and I would say the toughest time and I think everyone on here can relate to this is um, working on the post overdose response team we had a lot of deaths and so there were a lot of peers um, who died and yeah. so you know it, it's very fast paced you yeah. you recognize it you feel it and then you move on to help the next one and um, I've heard this before but it's like stepping over bodies because you got to save got to help support the next one, not say, but yeah. um, I think that is kind of the, the hardest um, yeah. part, and that's oh, for that. anybody who works in this field. It is, it is not easy, it's, it certainly takes an emotional toll, so thank you for sharing that, Courtney, and I think I'm glad that both of you had positive experiences, but also some experiences to learn from, and in the advisory group, it's been really helpful to hear from folks You've had great experiences and what that means, like what it means to have a great experience, what it means to have maybe peer support specialists who are able to mentor and help them define the role and put the boundaries around it that they need. And also we've heard some not good experiences where agencies maybe don't know how to use peers or they're afraid of liability issues. And so you've got wonderful peer specialists who are you know, doing administrative work or paperwork or transportation. Um, so that idea of making sure peers are well supported, their role is well defined, and providers really know how to maximize the awesomeness that is peers is really critical, I think, for us going forward. So, Elliot, I think you're here. I don't know if we have any questions in the chat we want to want to do while we have Benji and Courtney here. I think Elliot was going to do our chat. Is Elliot, are you doing our chat or Anne Marie? Maybe Anne Marie, you were doing our chat today. I think we have some other questions, but not you are. To, to Benji and, and Courtney. We have peer, we have, I see we have other questions. And remember, folks, when you do your questions, we're trying to answer them live. Um, yeah, um, but we have some, we have some peer questions. We have two hands. You want to take the peer hands, Elliot? Oh, we got three. I see Angela Christine up first. Hey, Angela Christine. Hello, how are you? Good, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. So I am putting on my um, consumer hat today and I have a question for um, the two peer specialists and um, it may roll over to um, director. Um, so as an EOR, um, one of our things is I would love to use peer supports to fill the roles that I have open. So, mm -hmm. and so in the case of, you know, some, someone has IDD, I really can't use someone who also has IDD, but um, my husband is a veteran and I am a former foster, um, foster care from childhood. So there I would love to, there's some peer aspects there. So that could help us out with those open roles. So one of the problems that I have come across with is one of the requirements of an EOR is that our candidates have to pass a background check with no convictions. And some of the peer specialists, that's that's a roadblock for them. 
-hmm. is there something that can be done? And then I wanted to ask the specialists, is that something that like, have, would they be interested in looking at not just this, this one area, would you look at expanding into other areas that DHHS happens to be in like IDD, if it was like a full-time position for you? Do you want me to, Benji, Courtney, if I could speak to the regulatory stuff just right quick, because we actually had a lot of questions come in in the Q&A about when we're talking about certified peer support specials, we just talk about mental health or substance use, and we did highlight that a lot today. I think one of the things that we're also trying to accomplish with uh, kind of the revision of our peer support work, and this speaks to what you're asking, Angela, Christine, is making sure that we are uh, broad and inclusive, but that that means how do we make sure that we are uh, supporting IDD peers, peers with TBI? Um, how does that fit into things like the waiver and providing additional services supports for folks on the waiver or on the waiting list? And um, um, how do we have things like dual certification? We've got a lot of questions, right? Folks, can I, can I support someone with IDD and mental health issues? Of course we want that, right? Family peers comes up a lot. Family peers are incredibly important. Um, so the, the goal with peers is not to just be like real rigid and look at mental health and substance use. It's to make sure that we have uh, a broad range of offering because peers have a lot, and we've got lots of peer programs. Maybe they're just not reimbursed right now where families are supporting families, people with IDD are supporting families. And Angela, Christine, you also mentioned some regulatory barriers. So things like that have come up, like needing a driver's license or a high school diploma or other things within the waivers that stop peers, IDD peers or family peers from supporting each other. So there's a lot there to unpack, but there's a lot that we're working at because the goal is to have inclusive, supported peers. We think they're valuable. We think we should have them across the spectrum of our services. And in some cases that might mean removing some administrative barriers that we have. But Benji and Courtney, I'll let you have the last word on this because we're at time, but feel free to add anything that you wanna add from your perspective on that. Um, Director Crosby, I, you know, I agree. I think it's something that we do have to look at from our regulatory um, background. Yeah. Because let's let's be honest, most peers are just as involved. Um, mm, yeah. At some point in time, right? And it really it really depends on if it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Yeah. Um, we lose out on a lot of really good peers that have already done their time, and especially now when we're getting into forensic peer support, right? Yes. That, who better to connect and help somebody That's than right. somebody that has done time mm -hmm. and knows how to work through that system with somebody? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's the same in, in the four teams. I hear it a lot at, at the Department of Health. Um, you know, we can't hire this person because of their backgrounds. Yeah. And I, I do think that's something that's a very good point that, that you brought up. And thank you for letting me uh, put my two cents worth in on it. No, oh, thank you for that, Benji. And I'm, I'm with you, 100% with you. Everything you said. Courtney, anything you want to add? Um, no, I just, it is a very good point. I um, thank God and one of the ones whose background is not too you know, there's not too much on there, a small little misdemeanor from, you know, 20 years ago, maybe, but um, everyone I've worked with all have felony. So <clears throat> that is definitely a, um, a block from some really good peer support because the young lady who took my role, in my opinion, is the best we've ever had. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for that, Courtney. So we are very out of time today. We've gone over a little bit. So I really want to thank Benji and Courtney for coming today. It was just great to spend some time with you and speak with you. And Courtney, I hope you've joined our advisory committee if you have time. Benji, I'm glad you're on it. So I look forward to seeing you guys again at the advisory committee. We do have questions. Uh, we tried to answer a lot in the Q&A, but there's still some hands and some questions. So please get those in the Q&A so we can follow up on the answers to some of those questions. And um, thank you again for being with us today. It's great that you're with us every month. Remember, we're going to send the slides out and there are links. This is just our big meeting, right? We're going to cover things from a high level perspective. Please join any of our standing meetings during the month. Please come to and volunteer for any of our advisory meetings. We are super glad to have you. We want to connect with you. We want to hear your voice and your opinion. 
Um, so thanks so much for being with us today and please joining us at any of our other meetings throughout the week. Benji and Courtney, you guys are awesome. I truly appreciate what you do every day and thank you for coming today and sharing your wisdom with us. So, all right. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.